I will quickly call the roll, starting with the community boards. Community board one. Community board two. Present. Community board three. Community board four. Community board five. Here. Community board six. Present. Community board seven. Community board eight. <clears throat> community board nine. Community board 10. Present. Community board 11. Here. Community board 12. Here. Community board 13. Community board 14. Community board 15. Here. Community board 16. Here. Community board 17. Community board 18. Okay, agencies, ACS, Public Library, Commission on Human Rights, Con Edison, Department for the Aging, Department of Buildings, Here. Department of City Planning, DCAS, Department of Consumer Affairs, Department of Corrections, Department of Design and Construction, Department of Environmental Protection, Department of Finance, Here. Department of Health, Here. Department of Homeless Services, Department of Housing and Preservation Development, Do It, Department of Parks and Recreation, is that here? Yes. Okay. Department of Probation, Department of Sanitation North, Present. Department of Sanitation South, Department of Transportation, Present. Department of Youth and Community Development, Fire Department, yeah. HRA, yeah. Mayor's Office of Community Assistance, National Grid, New York City Transit, yeah. Office of Emergency Management, Police Department North, Police Department South, Small Business Services, U.S. Postal Service, Verizon, 311. Yeah. All right. So we are going to jump right into it. Um, there are a bunch of flyers at the table when you first sign in about upcoming events at Borough Hall. Um, I'll trust you all to take a copy of those and share it with your uh, respective constituencies. Tomorrow we have a job fair here at Borough Hall. Uh, beginning at the end of the month, we have a series of summertime concerts. There's a whole schedule in the, the flyer in the front. Next Thursday, the 21st, we are doing a uh, road mapping session for parents with children of special needs to help navigate the education system here at Bro Hall at 6 p.m. Uh, but there's more information on all those events on the flyers. We'll turn right into it and we'll go to our first presentation, which is a uh, presentation by 311. You guys wanna come up? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Joe Morrisro. I'm the executive director of New York City 311. My colleague. And I'm Shaleem Thomason. I'm the communications director at 311. And first and foremost, I want to say thank you to the borough president and the staff here for inviting us and giving us this opportunity to share a little bit more about 311 for folks. I think uh, the range of information may vary. A lot of folks may be familiar, some may not be. In the interest of both uh, time as well as uh, temperature, as you said. I will try to go through fairly quickly, um, and we can allot time at the end for questions. Is perfect. the best way to do that? I'll let you be the master of that. So let's, um, ah, perfect. I picked the right side of the clicker. Uh, so let me start off, what I'd like to do this morning is give just a quick overview, uh, baselining what 311 is, talk about um, a little bit of, of the different channels, as we call them, that we have and then really get into uh, what some of the key aspects of how we interact with customers, as well as, uh, as requested, how we interact with city agencies. And I know a number of our, our agencies are here as well, so um, uh, they can relate to those experiences. Um, and then I also want to share a few of the reporting tools that exist today in case folks are not aware of those. So by way of background, I think folks probably know, 301 is now uh, 13 years old, going on 13 years old, um, just had our 12th anniversary back in March, just took our 200 millionth call back in March as well, so fairly entrenched at this point. I won't go into all the details, but life before 311, uh, since then a lot has been consolidated, obviously not just into a call center, which is how 311 started, but into a multiple channel platform. Uh, what I do want to make mention of though is, 
is our mission and how we focus on accessibility, accountability, and transparency. Uh, and in particular, on the accessibility side, we really pride ourselves on making sure we have quick and easy access and provide the best, qual best possible quality customer service. By way of explaining a little bit, uh, I'll use the call center as the example, since that is our, how we started and continues to be a large portion of what we do. Um, some of the features of 3 on one you probably know already, but uh, we're 24-7, we're always open, we've never closed. Uh, came close a couple of times during some of the emergencies, but we stayed open. Uh, we have access to 180 languages uh, that's at the job itself, at the location itself. We have English and Spanish language speakers. And then we contract with a vendor to provide the other services. We use Language Line uh, for any other language up to those 180. Uh, we have a layered integrated voice response. That's a fancy name for that thing you hear anytime you call any customer service that says press one, press two. We've got one of those. Uh, we've actually streamlined it over the last year and reduced it. We're pretty pleased with that. Uh, but that helps us address some of the standard questions as well as some of the basic announcements, especially during winter time or during uh, volatile summer months. Uh, when people want to know about status, winter, for example, schools open or close, is alternate site parking in effect or not in effect, and uh, whether sanitation schedules are on normal or, or holiday schedule. So it serves a purpose very well there. Uh, 350 professional staff, um, very, very proud of our staff. We have frontline reps who take the calls. Uh, they are civil servants, as well as the majority of all the other staff uh, who are basically support staff. So you have reps who take the call, and as I like to say, everybody else's job in the call center, everyone else's job at 311 is to support those people that are taking the calls. And we do that through a variety of ways. We have a training department, a quality assurance department. We have an agency relations team who works with our colleague agencies. Uh, that comprises that staff. Uh, we also augment that with a uh, group of college students through the CUNY program. Uh, college students on a part-time basis. If they do well in school, maintain a grade point average and a course load, they can work for us part-time. Great opportunity, it's a great program uh, for the college students as well as for 311. Uh, and then rounding it out, we have um, a number of services we offer. Services are basically answers to questions. We have over 3,000 of those. We do represent city agencies. We also deal with a little bit of Fed and state. A lot of folks will call us not making the distinction, of course, between city, state, and Fed. Uh, so we try to handle some of those inquiries as well. And we're busy, 53,000 calls a year last year, and as I mentioned, 200 million year to date. Uh, I won't take you through this chart, it's quite busy. Um, a lot of peaks and valleys there, but uh, the solid black line is just the growth over time. It's uh, the, the, the axis there is actually uh, monthly call volume. And what really stands out is the red spikes, if you see those. Uh, that's when call volume spikes tremendously, either for a single event, such as a, a hurricane or a blizzard, or over a period of time, such as a tough winter, or even a national election, we get a lot of calls. So uh, those red bars, uh, red, red spikes, sh show some of the biggest uh, hits that we've had. We've taken over 200 and something thousand calls on many days. And one of the takeaways from that, though, is that whenever we had a huge spike, even from the earliest days of 311, um, the volume patterns would change after that. People became aware because of, a uh, because of an, an emergency event such as weather or, or you know, one of those situations, and then they continued to use it. The other noteworthy item on this chart is that it's really an unsustainable model. You can't just keep building out a call center and staffing that with people to handle calls. You have to give customers different ways to be able to access the information that 311 has. So fortunately, around about the time of the economic crisis, we were on a path to try to diversify, not just be a call center, but really to open it up through an online option. And I'll talk a few moments about some of the other options we've been able to introduce. And I'll talk about that now. Um, so a couple of things on this chart, and this will help segue into how we interact and how we deal with other city agencies, which I think is one of the questions. Uh, but the first piece is, if you take a look at uh, the different, the center part of that chart, those are the different channels that exist now for a customer to access information from the city. Uh, the call center, of course, is, the, is still the, the largest, but the other channels ha are growing and, in often cases, finding their own niche. So 311 online is part of nyc.gov. Uh, it's uh, very prominent there. You can get pretty much all the information and, and services you can get by calling the call center, you can do on your own through 311 online. There's a few occasions that we can't for certain security or privacy reasons, but pretty much everything else is out there. Uh, we have a text program. You can text us at 311-692. That's 311-NYC. 
Uh, and uh, it provides, again, the same type of information. Uh, the source data for any answer to a text question is 311 online. So it's all very consistent there. Social media, Shalim heads that up for us. We're very prominent on Facebook, on Twitter, as well as Facebook, and just starting to grow on Instagram. But on Twitter is really our biggest piece, and we actually not only push information out that's relevant city information, but we now actually engage with customers not only to answer questions they may have and try to land them at the right point, but we also take certain service requests. Uh, we use that term, but you may want to call it complaints. And we take a handful of those through the Twitter and so and sorry the Twitter and Facebook process. Uh, mobile app. Uh, if you don't have our mobile app already, I encourage you to use it. If you have an iPhone or an Android, it's easy to download, and it's really shown a tremendous amount of growth in the last year. Uh, it can do a number of things. It's, it was originally designed to handle complaints, uh, and there's a whole suite of different complaint types you can do. Many of them you can associate with having a mobile app and being out and about. Uh, it's a very easy process. It's actually faster than going through the call center, so we really encourage people to use that. But the mobile app is also terrific for basic information, uh, parking, garbage, school information, the same things you can get by calling the call center. Really through a, a swipe and a click is available on the mobile app. And lastly, we have a chat program as well, and that's really designed to help make sure when people go online to 31 Online, we want them to stay online. We want them to make sure they have a good experience so they don't have to use the phone channel. Uh, because one, if you're already online, we want to keep you there, and frankly, it's less expensive. So we do have a chat program that uh, helps assist those customers. So you can reach 311 in a number of different ways and you can get information. Um, from all those channels last year, there were 28 million contacts with customers. By far the largest was the call center and the phone channel side of that, but the split was about 74% phone channel, 26% all the other channels. Just four or five years ago, that split was more like 99-1. So we've really expanded those self-service channels, which is really part of the goal of meeting our customers where they are and making sure that we offer equity, equality, and opportunity for all customers in New York. So you can really reach us through whatever way works for you as a customer. Um, the other interesting thing is that volume, 28 million, a lot of people think of 311 as a complaint hotline, which we certainly are, but that's actually a very small portion of what 311 does for the public. And I'll talk about that now. Um, you see the far right, has three outcomes. Um, customers will call and they have a myriad of questions. Like I said, we have over 3,000, almost 4,000 different types of services we offer. But the answers can really be bucketed into three outcomes for the most part. We're either providing information, we're referring the customer somewhere else, typically outside of the city because they don't make the distinction, or we're taking a service request, what we would also call a complaint. So I'll talk a little bit about each of those. The information provided is by far the largest. It can be the most popular reason why people call 311, just to check on alternate side parking, even though it's available everywhere else in the city and every other piece of information has it, uh, people still want to hear the 311 announcement say that. And if it's a uh, suspended for a holiday or for weather reasons, we will get well over 100,000 customers calling just to confirm alternate side parking is suspended. But there are a lot of other things that we provide information on, from hours of operation for a library, to garbage and recycle collection schedules, uh, to health and human services information, and find the information for customers. So it's a, it's a wide, uh, wide bucket, if you will, uh, but it's very popular and very well used. The referral side, as I said, it's more we're getting you to an endpoint. Uh, when 301 first started, there were a number of other city agencies that still had call centers. That's been reduced over the years. They've been consolidated to within 311. So we very rarely refer someone to another city agency via the phone. Um, we would do that for DEP, for water billing, for example, because they handle your billing account. But pretty much everything else in the city is handled within 311. So that's often when someone needs to be referred because they called us to make a complaint about the MTA. So customers don't make the distinction about the MTA in New York City between city versus state, but obviously it's a state agency, a state authority. So we don't handle that and we transfer that on. Uh, that's a very small portion these days. And finally, the service request process. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, also known as complaint process. And what we do is we do the intake for city agencies. And that's probably the simplest starting point to think about it. Um, any complaint a customer makes has a, a what, where, when, why, and sometimes a who to it. Uh, interestingly, the who is the least important in taking a complaint. It's really about the what and the where and the when. Um, and that's the role that 311 plays. So whether you're 
going through the call center and talking to one of our, our civil service professionals, civil service reps, or whether you're doing it online or whether you're using the mobile app, the structure is pretty much the same. You, you as the customer want to report something or you want to request something from the city. I'll use the report a problem first. Um, it's an incident. What we ask for is the information associated with that incident. There's different categories that it would go into. All of that's designed to make sure the intake is simple for the customer and understandable for the customer, but that it also works on the back end for the agency. Because what we want to do is use that information from the customer to be able to give the agency what they need to be able to categorize the problem. And in turn, they're going to use that as a, think of it as a work ticket or a work order. Um, they're going to make determinations about how to approach that, when to approach it, what type of equipment they're going to need, what type of resource they're going to need, how to dispatch somebody to go out and fill that pothole, fix that street light, uh, to prune that tree, whatever the case may be. Um, so we're on that front end side doing that intake. That makes the customer go through a fairly standard process. Some customers like it because it's structured and allows them to answer it. I'll be honest, some customers don't like it because they want to just give a quick answer and I can fully understand that. And one of the things we've been trying to do over the years is to reduce that burden on the customer to try to make their input as simple as possible. But we do balance that on the back end, the need of the back end to provide some level of specifics for the city agency. But basically all that's taken into a form. It's an electronic form. It gets logged. The first thing that happens is the customer gets a service level agreement or a service level expectation. We, either through the call center or through the online or the mobile app, will tell the customer, typically this type of request is fulfilled or responded to by the agency in X period of time, whether that be hours or whether that be days. That's the first thing we want customers to have. Second thing a customer gets is they get a confirmation number. Any service request that's opened up with 311 gets a confirmation number, uh, service request number. Um, if you do it, if you give an email or if you do it online, you can get that via email. That becomes important for the customer to track. It's also the same tracking number that the agency will use. Electronic complaint thing goes So in conclusion, <laughs> uh, thank you. The electronic complaint then goes to the city agency who actually receives it in what we call an intake process. Uh, almost all of the city agencies use the same system that 311 uses, so we're actually in the same system, different views of it. And that agency will receive that, and now I'm, I'm speaking as a, a 311 person, not an agency person, but then each agency has their way of going and working that. Um, as I mentioned, there is a tracking number, so that stays true through the process. And as the agency goes through the process, either fulfills that request or completes it, or it, it goes through stages, the agency will update that ticket, if you think of it in that respect. Um, that update will then pass back through to the 311 system. So again, a call center rep or a customer in public can actually just go online, can call the call center, whatever, and check the status of that service request number. Um, sometimes there's gaps in status because nothing does happen. It, something, something takes time. And if it takes seven days, there's really not gonna be a difference between day two, day three, day four. And that's one of the reasons why we really try to set the service level expectation up front so people will understand how many days it typically takes. Um, that information is then also used by the agencies when they're doing their reporting on uh, uh, citywide performance reporting on how quickly and thoroughly they respond to complaints and requests and how quickly they close those out. So that becomes a key part. It's very linked, if you think of it that way, from the time a customer makes a request to it goes through its life cycle and actually gets fulfilled. Um, so that's a, that's a basic approach to that. I want to take just one moment and, and drift away from this for a bit and then just talk about one other element that's very important to us and hopefully something that people appreciate and realize when they call 311 or use any aspect of 311. We do take our focus on customer service and customer satisfaction very serious. One of the things I'm very proud of is over the years we've been able to contract with a private company who is a leader in the industry when it comes to measuring goods and services in the United States. They're called CFI Group. And one of the things CFI does for us is does a survey every year. It's a very lengthy one. It's 25 questions. It's very engaged. And they go through and do the science on it to say, how well are we doing? Uh, now, this is really geared for the call center more than the other channels. But they're able to pick out very quickly what we do well uh, and what we're not doing well so we can fix that. They go through varying layers to come up with the score. And that's important to us. 
The other piece, though, that's even more important is they then compare us to their hundreds of other clients that they have in government and private sector, and they say, where did we net out? So we're very pleased that each year of the last three to four years, the customer satisfaction with 311 has been far better than the average government. It's been far better than the average in the private sector, and we really compete at the very highest end of the private sector, the, the high-end hospitality and finance areas. And that's very important, as I said, because that's one of our missions. It's also really a credit to the women and the men who work at 311, who are very dedicated uh, every day in, day out. They, they're, they're heroes when the weather changes and becomes a problem, but every day, day in, day out. They may take 80 calls a day to 100 calls a day. We have some reps who have taken 20,000 calls in a year. We have some reps who have taken over 200,000, sorry, over 100,000 calls since they started. And it's amazing to see how they can handle the first call of their day as equally and as good as the last call of their day. And that's because of this focus on quality. So, so we're very pleased with that. Um, I mentioned that we want to talk a little bit about reporting. In the interest of time, I'll be very brief on these, but I just want to make sure people are aware of these. Um, we've come a long way from the early days of LL47 reports and, and meetings, which were used to be in a PDF format. Now you have three main ways, whether uh, you're a community board, whether you're a constituent, uh, whether you're a first-time customer or a multiple-use customer, whether you're the press, who also like to use these tools, um, but they're available to everyone all through nyc.gov. First one is our service request map. You see it's outlined for the community board one here. And the yellow dots just show you concentrations of complaints that have been opened. Um, there's a legend. Again, I won't go through all the details on that, but um, if you do need more information on that, there are some basic steps on the website itself. And uh, it's fairly, fairly intuitive to use. Uh, you know, first time, you may have to go through a little bit to get to understand how to use the, the filters. But it's very, very useful if you want to find out, have complaints been opened in this area? How many? What are they? And what's the status? Because if you click on the little yellow dot, you'll see a dialog box open up. And if you have better eyes than I do, you can see that dialog box right above the term service request map. And it'll give you status on those. Uh, we are cognizant of privacy, so not all complaints are listed on this map. Um, in addition to complaints, I mentioned we take requests. Sometimes we do what we call literature requests. They're not a complaint, but you're asking for a service. A good example of that is, is senior meals. So you can make a request for senior meals. Well, we certainly don't want to put the map of seniors asking for senior meals out here so someone could find that and plot around that. So, so there are some things that, that are not shown on there, but again, mostly all the complaint types are available there. The other way to actually access information is the uh, open data portal. Uh, it's managed by Do It. It's open data for the city. There's thou yeah, thousands, hundreds at least of data sets. I think it might be thousands of data sets now. But one of them is the uh, service request, 311 service request since 2010. Uh, this one is a little bit more involved. It's a little bit more difficult to navigate than just using a map. If you have anyone uh, who's familiar with it, it's great. Again, you have to invest a little bit of time. I do believe that Do It, in partnership with Councilmember Baca's office, have offered some tutorials on this. Those would be very helpful if you find it something that you want to use. This is really key because every service request from 2010 forward uh, is available to be, uh, be searched and downloaded. The really key is that you can export this. You can search on a number of factors, date, time, place, location, community board, zip code, park. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different ways to search. And then once you have the data, you can either use it or you can export it to an Excel file or to a presentation file. So it's a very good tool. There is a little bit of a learning curve, I will say that. And then the third way is, our, is more traditional. It's one that's been in existence for a while. As I said, it used to be just hard PDF reports. Now it's a little bit more interactive. It's the local law 47 reporting, also available on the website. Um, I think those are it. I think the other piece. So the last one I wanted to show was to really kind of go back and kind of close out on how the service request process works or how 3-on-1 interacts with city agencies when it comes time to taking a service request. So this is a nice chart because if you see the center part there, if you get the icon, it's a pothole. It's a car that hit a pothole. Um, the key is you can do it many different ways. You can do it over the phone, you can do it online, you can use our mobile app, which is a picture of it there, or you can now do it through social media. Again, just a few years ago, you were limited to reporting that through a phone call. Now you have multiple ways of doing that. And simple process is, you know, first the service request is created by 311. Um, it then gets submitted directly to DOT, in this case, because it's a pothole. Uh, DOT does its work associated with that. It goes to a roadway maintenance crew. And then DOT will then update the status. Um, the DOT then provides that updated service request. And then an email is sent to the customer if the customer provided the email. And even if they didn't, that status gets updated there. So, so the flow kind of works you know, 
multi-direction. We've shown it in one direction here. Um, but really it's a matter of working with the agencies to make sure we, working with the customer and the agency to make sure we set the expectation, we get the right information, get that to the agency, and then let the agencies do their job. I think New York City agencies do a terrific job in terms of what they have on their plate, and our goal is to get them the information accurately and completely so they can do that job. So in the interest of time, I think that would close us out for the presentation piece, and Great. If you want to handle questions? Thank you. Uh, we have questions from the service cabinet. Good morning. My name is Josephine Beckman. I'm the district manager of Community Board 10, which is Bay Ridge, Diker Heights, and Fort Hamilton. Um, so my question really speaks about um, what our mandate is as district managers, and, and that is um, we analyze a lot of data, and, and the 311 data has been very helpful in, in analyzing service delivery within our community districts. And my question involves in some of our difficulties uh, interacting sometimes and reviewing that data with, with some of our agencies. And so I had some questions and I was hoping maybe you could help. Um, sometimes we call 311 if we receive complaints from residents who don't want to go through the time of calling 311 if we have chronic conditions. If we file a complaint to 311, um, and we've had instances where we have and it's referred to an agency, and the agency doesn't close out that complaint. It does not appear on open data. Um, can you tell us why, can you tell me, or I just want to explain why that is, or understand why that is. Uh, can I ask what you mean by it does not appear, the, the complaint doesn't appear, or the, the complaint status? doesn't appear. Oh. Um, so that if I call, say, for example, I mean, I have a list of complaints, I'll take an example of commercial vehicles parked overnight, which is a problem, and so when we ask for resources for tow trucks right. to come to it, I want to be able to go to open data, pull mm -hmm. the commercial vehicle complaints within my district, to demonstrate we have this need. And what I found was those that I had filed to 311 that were not closed by the agency did not appear on open data. Okay. I, I follow you, and I okay. understand the, re the need for that as well as what you're asking for. I wasn't aware that they were not showing up. Um, I would have to check with Do It to understand that. The 311, 311 itself doesn't update open data. Uh, once we take the request and we submit it to the agency, it is then feeds into a, what they call a business intelligence tool. That tool is what is sourcing um, the open data. So it's basically supposed to go in and pull that. I know there are a few exceptions. I don't think uh, derelict vehicle is one of the exceptions, so I don't think that's the case. But there are a few exceptions of what's not included in there. Um, but as to why a cl a not, a, an open complaint would be not in there, I don't know that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've noticed that there aren't too many open complaints on open data. Usually the complaints that appear on open data are closed. Um, usually have a short term um, right. response base, but. Yeah. I just find as a, as a DM, I want to know which complaints haven't sure, been sure. Um, yep. addressed as I review weekly. Um, I do a weekly review right. of, of open data. Mm -hmm. The other question is if, um, if we notice a trend or a, a, an agency-related problem, for example, um, street cave-ins is a common problem that we deal with all the time. Um, the Mayor's Office of Operation has now changed kind of the reporting system. So when we call in a cave-in, it is first, all street conditions are referred to the Department of Transportation. If the Department of Transportation deems that a corrective action report is necessary from the Department of Environmental Protection, that complaint is closed out, and we kind of lose track mm -hmm. of how long those corrective action reports stay open. So the data then becomes a little bit difficult for us to track, and when we we certainly can follow up with the agency, which is oftentimes a little difficult because of the number of, of complaints we have. So um, my question is, could we, or could district managers request that that uh, even one complaint remain open until, or a new one be created through DEP so mm -hmm. that we can track those open corrective action reports? Um, and is that something we would ask you to do? Is that something, you know, how, would, how could we request that? Right. I follow you again. Okay. Um, we would certainly be involved in that. We have actually were working with operations as well as DOT and DO, DEP a few years back when that decision was made to route street defects to DOT first. Um, so we would be involved in that, but the agency would have to drive that. If they would want 311 to open up a new request, if they'd want the requester to open up a new request, we would take our direction from, in this case, DOT and DEP more than likely. Um, so we would be part of that discussion, but we would not be the lead on that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Question, Sean? Um, I, 
Sean Campbell from Community Board 14, Flatbush Midwood. Sorry for my tardiness this morning. Um, I have a few questions. I'm going to ask them all at once because I think they're interrelated. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about agency interface with the 311 system. It seems to me they're, they're, they don't interface all in the same way. For instance, DOT can't even look up a complaint by the 311 number. They have their own tracking system. We usually have to go by address with them, whereas other agencies can look it up by the 311 tracking number. Um, some agencies seem to get the information in real time. Other agencies seem to have a lag with their agency's 311 complaints. Um, they're also, I, I'm also wondering if there's a, um, an inconsistency in data collection at the 311 starting point um, for instance I believe that some complaints are taking are, are taken multiple times you can call the same complaint in over and over again other complaints we already have it reported thank you very much and so it only counts once so you have sort of a mismatch in the way things get counted how many times things are complained about um, and then when I compare the 311 data, the, the most reported 311 complaints in my district, they vary greatly from the 311, or from the, the service delivery requests we get directly in the office. So um, it's something we've talked about before as district managers, how we put these two different pieces of the puzzle together and how we explain why different complaints are going in different directions. I'll try to answer all three in the in the order. Um, first, I'll characterize as uh, the, the complaint number uh, is going through the process. Um, there are a handful of agencies, think of the big infrastructure agencies, DOT, DEP, sanitation are three examples, where three one, the, the, the agency is not integrated with the 311 system, right? So whereas parks and health and NYPD are integrated with the same 311 system, 3-on-1 actually does the intake in the 3-on-1 system and then has to send it to the agency's legacy system. That can be done one of two ways. One by data, where you just have a data bridge that takes it from 3-on-1 system, converts it into a form, and sends it to the agency system. The other way is 3-on-1 rep generalist transfers the call to 3-on-1 rep specialist, who then goes into that actual city agency, DOT, sanitation system, their legacy system, and actually enters it in. But on the intake side, all 301 service requests, um, the number that you get for 301 service request, are all trackable and, and should, be should be able to look those up using that service request number. You should not need to use a DOT number or anything to that effect. If you have a separate standalone number from another agency, that I don't know. I, I don't know if that's an internal process or not. But the ones that we have, the ones that we do in the intake on, they're linked in a way that you can check it, whether you're checking 301 online, whether you're checking the DOT page, you can still use the same service request. Um, so that was, that was one. So I think that ties to the second question, which was about um, the different uh, intake process. Is that, yeah, can you help many, me with that? How many times a complaint is counted? How many times a complaint is counted, yes. Um, for the most part, we take a complaint and don't do what you'll call a duplicate check or a parent-child check on a complaint because multiple people can make, the same, make a complaint about the same incident. There are a few complaint types for certain city agencies where the agency has asked us to go through a screening process to see if a complaint has already been opened for that. Um, I think I know one of them off the top of my head, but I don't want to say it because I may get it wrong, but there's a small number that do that. For the most part, though, we don't do that. Every, every complaint that comes in, we take and then process that along, um, as I said, with a, with a couple of exceptions. And the last one you mentioned about reconciling data to your service map or to your service data, I'm not sure what that is. Uh, yeah, well, I think it's, that's more of an ongoing conversation that we'd probably like to have with the agency and would do it as well because we, I, I do, we have talked about it in terms of it being two different pieces of a puzzle and, and how to fit it together so we know we're getting the whole picture. Um, if I could just follow up very quickly on the, um, uh, on the complaints. It, to me, it's helpful to know whether a complaint is being uh, if, if, if an issue is being, um, if it's affecting multiple people, right. do we have one person calling multiple times because mm -hmm. they have a chip on their shoulder or because it's just affecting one person, which is still important, but that's very different than the entire block or the entire four block radius is, is being affected by something. So that's why I was asking that one. No, I, I follow that. I'll add a little bit of editorial to that. We share that because from an inbound call center management perspective, it'd be great if we could have one person call about one topic instead of 20 people calling. You know, I, I sometimes say, you know, on a hot summer night, a car radio with a loud, loud radio pulls up in front of an apartment building, we get 50 calls on the same topic, topic, right? So if you could consolidate that down. So I follow that. We'd be happy to be part of any discussion as we look at how to handle those. 
questions? Marnie? Yes. Good morning. My name is Marnie Elias Pavi. I'm the district manager, Community Board 11, Bath Beach and Bensonhurst. Um, I have a concern um, just adding on to what my colleague said about um, using the 311 data for the, the monitoring of, of city services. I find and I have found that certain 311 complaints that have been filed with an agency has been changed once it was entered. And, and I have a concern about that if there is, for example, this isn't the agency it happened to, but if I have a pothole or a cave-in and I submit that and I get a confirmation from a cave-in, I don't believe that it should be changed by the agency to a pothole. Um, and we're finding that and therefore we can't see exactly what's going on. So how is the data maintained for integrity purposes? Uh, very good question. I don't know how it gets changed from you know, the example you use from cave in to pothole. Um, I, from a data integrity standpoint, we don't have the ability to do that. We'd have to open up, a, 301 would have to open up a new request, so that would show up differently. But if you had an original request and it was changed by an agency, yes. that I don't know. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to not answer your question, I just don't know no, the no. detail. <laughs> But as, as the district manager, that concerns me because I utilize that data. Sure, you're tracking capi by, by capi And at right. capital yeah. expense. If I see yeah. there's an issue, for example, there's a sewer odor that's right. affecting a large segment of the area, that tells me there's an issue there, especially if it's ongoing. But once that complaint is changed sure. to a catch basin clog, that's very different. Sure, and, and you lose the, the tracking and the, and the data on that piece, but I understand, I understand the, the challenge and the problem there. Um, I don't know the guidelines for when an agency makes that change, and then second, how that data integrity would work backwards. You know, can we link it to the original complaint number? Is there a way to do that? I, I don't know, but that would be some way to solve that problem. So I guess my question really is, the data should never really be changed. It should be in the updates. Odor unfounded, it was a clogged catch right. basin so that you could see. Right. That just makes me very concerned. Am I using this data and is it sure. accurate yep. for our needs? Yep. I, I follow that. I, we also, I mean, I would have a similar concern because as we're trying to answer a question for a customer sure. you know, who doesn't have the, the, you know, the access that you may have, um, we, run, we could run into that same problem. So again, I, I, not trying to not answer no, your no, question, no, okay. um, I'd be happy to be part of a discussion uh, mm -hmm. to talk about that with an agency and with do it. Um, there are a lot of data elements associated with every complaint, so there can be some trickiness, I guess. Um, so nailing that out or, or hammering that out may be a good, uh, a good thing to tackle. But Maybe so, we could do that, Andrew, as a group. Um, I'm sure other district managers have that concern. I, I, I mentioned um, a little bit premature, but uh, it's now public, so I'll mention it. But um, the system we use is now 12 to 13 years old, and I jokingly tell people, you probably don't have a cell phone that's 12 to 13 years old anymore, right? So uh, we need an upgraded system. Just last week it was announced that the city put out an RFS to request uh, bids for a new system. Uh, it's not gonna happen overnight, it's gonna take some time, but we're excited about the opportunity to have that and a number of things that have been limitations from duplicate checks to data integrity are all things that we've already spelled out in some of the initial requirements. And then there'll be a lot more work that goes on, obviously, as we move through the process. But we're excited about modernizing our platform. It's called the CRM, Customer Relationship Management Platform. So this will be a great opportunity to tackle some of the things that have not, we've either had to patchwork it or have not worked in the past. So I just want to add one more thing because I, I, I do enjoy using your apps and, and the availability of it. And, and I use it quite often Great. when I'm out in the community. Um, I, I'm finding that I have many, many complaints that are not um, being closed out or addressed on the app. Is there a problem or, or do I need to go back to the computer to enter every one? to look uh, for a status? You, you certainly don't have to go back to the computer to do that. That, that should be a fully, it's, it's all part of the same enterprise solution. So uh, I'd be happy to take a look at some of those sure. examples, if you don't mind, maybe sure. later, and, and we'll check and see if there's an issue with it. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Additional question, Barry? Hi, Barry Spitzer, Community Board 12. Good morning. Uh, just have a, is there a mechanism, does 3-1 have a mechanism to assign a, uh, priority status to like more of an urgent uh, service request um, and does that get transferred to the particular agency 
that the case is assigned to. Okay. Um, three on one doesn't assign a priority, but some agencies do, and they, we build that into the service request process. Um, DEP has a, has a um, I think they call it a dire or an urgent situation on flooding, street flooding perhaps. Um, so when we take the complaint, it gets filled out in a way that is standard, but a code is, is populated, if you will. And when that service request goes to DEP, they know that that's a priority versus another type of a complaint. And then they would have their own work rules as to how they follow that. Okay, so um, 3 one does have the, uh, at the point of intake, 3 one has the capacity to uh, label it like an urgent uh, matter. It, it, we, we, would, we would do the intake as we normally would right. if it was a, a condition that could be standard or, or urgent the business rules in that service request that we work on with the agency would actually drive that. It wouldn't be, for example, it wouldn't be the 311 operator who would have to make that determination. The business rules in the system would have to say, ask this question, fill it in with this data. Once this, if this field is populated, it now goes a different route or it goes on a priority basis. So the decision is actually made by the agency long before we even make the service request opportunity available to the public. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? Not really, because um, because three and one is the, is the first point of contact. So they should they should have the option of living something urgent. Right. It, well, if it if it's something that you that can be put in as urgent versus standard, then they the rep would fill that out, or the customer using it online at home right. would fill that out as well. But all of that logic is based into the into the requirements for completing a complaint. It's not based. It's not baked into uh, a rep making a decision. Um, and just to follow up on what Sean said uh, before, I find that when I when I speak to uh, members of the community, sometimes they they call uh, they call us sometimes uh, after they've called three and one, and uh, and obviously it's not three and one. It's the agency that's not responding for a variety of reasons, but they can list like. Uh, five, six, three and one complaint numbers. And just to follow up, I was wondering, um, when they called like the third or the fourth time, uh, didn't it uh, show up that this complaint was called in? And I'm not talking about multiple people calling about one problem. I'm, call I'm talking about one person about one problem. And they sometimes have five complaint numbers. And I'm wondering, you know, when they spoke to the three and one operator, um, didn't the 301 operators say, well, you called about this at this date, mm -hmm. and it's been forwarded to the agency instead of issuing a new complaint number? Right. right. I understand the question. We don't have that capability because we don't track your complaints issued by you. We actually track, the way you complete a complaint or file a complaint is by the location or the incident. So our reps could look up prior complaints using the service request number, but if Joe Morrisrow were to call in and say, hey, check my account, there is no account for Joe Morrisrow. Um, we don't build a customer account like you would for your cable company or your phone company. Um, so I don't have that, the rep doesn't have that ability to say, ah, you filed five different complaints in the last month and here's the status on Not each one. Not you, this particular complaint, uh, let's say a sidewalk has been cracked by a tree, right? For, for right. instance, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, calls up three one gets a complaint number. Now right. a week later, uh, calls again, and same address. Yep. Now, sidewalk is being cracked okay. by a tree. Yeah, I, I, appreciate the the I appreciate the clarification. Similar situation on the location side. So we take it. Our system doesn't have the ability to search that complaint. Oh, sorry, that location multiple times to see what's happened. An agency system may, but the three on one system doesn't have that ability today. Um, I mentioned the future CRM that we're going to have. It's going to have the ability to do account management and other types of asset lookup. Asset being a muni meter or a street, whatever, a, a curbstone, whatever it may be. Um, so that would give us that ability. But in today's system, on the intake side, when we first take the complaint in, we don't have that ability. Okay. Uh, and just a, a quick question. You mentioned that you have students that uh, work part-time yes. for 3 and one I was just wondering, uh, what type of training does a typical 3-in-1 operator go through? Uh, for a new hire, uh, they're hired off a civil service list um, for a title called call center representative. The training program lasts up to 10 weeks. 
first four weeks is training in uh, uh, basically classroom training. Uh, they, we call it experiential training. They're taught good customer service skills and how to navigate the system. And then they go through, so that's four weeks, and then they go through a period of being on the phones with some veteran employees and some coaching and training back in the classroom, back on the phones. So it takes about a 10 week period to become proficient. Okay, thank you. Uh, just to piggyback off his question about the training, when they go through the training, is there any sort of training from the agencies? A lot of times what happens when the 3 one call is made, the rep may place that complaint with the wrong agency or, or within the wrong department of that agency, and then the complaint sort of gets lost. So is there any sort of training pertaining to the agencies? Um, Yes, there is not directly with the new hires themselves, but it's actually with the agency, our group of agency relations, and then the trainers. We go through a pretty extensive, somewhat train the trainer, but to really drive home the point of how important it is to collect the actual information and co collect it accurately. On a quality control side, one of the things we do monthly with city agencies is we go through what we, uh, they use the term kickbacks, probably not the best term to use, but <laughs> that's what the agency is called. If, if we've entered something wrong, and the agency then, it, if, if it errors in the agency system, they'll contact our agency relations person. What we do then is we track that back, not only to what rep made that mistake, but more importantly, what training class did that rep come from? Did that, is it something we didn't cover there? So over the last few years, we've gotten much better about that because we've been able to standardize the complaint forms. So there's not a lot of variability, so hence less mistakes. But if we do get a mistake, the agency will let us know really within a day, and then we're able to, one, fix it, and then get to the source of that problem. So I just have one follow-up question, um, kind of piggybacking on what some of my colleagues said. I want to go back to my example of 311 complaints that just remain open and are never closed. Is there a mechanism by city agency, like for example, if, if there's a 10-day response indicated um, in the 311 um, disposition and that 10-day is not met, I have about 25 complaints that read past due and past due from February. So if that responsible agency um, never addressed the service complaint or maybe there was a problem, maybe they did address the service complaint, it just didn't appear on 311. Is there a message communicated to the agency from 311 or does it just die there and, and the complaint just goes away? Uh -huh. There is not a message from 311. We don't track those on an individual basis, uh, and we don't track those on a macro basis either. Um, but I do believe that the citywide performance reporting from the Mayor's Office of Operations and the Mayor's Office of Data Analytics have some tools to, to highlight that, that a, that a service request or, or a deliverable was not met. Um, I think that's at the aggregate level, uh, agency aggregate level, not an individual level. Um, but that would be, that would be the closest thing I could think of that would be able to call that out, uh, aside from doing your own tallying and your own tracking. Okay. So I guess my concern was that when I tried to do my own tracking, I, it, the complaints that I had entered didn't appear on open data. I didn't check them on the service delivery maps. I'm not sure if those reflect open or closed complaints. Um, but the open data portal did not um, show these open complaints. And there were about 25, which yeah. I felt was significant, so. Yeah. I, I agree with you there. And as I said, I, I would definitely look to, to share that with Do It. Um, I'll confirm one thing you said, the, the service request map uh, that we showed earlier. So that's the same data source. Um, same data. So it should, they should be in sync. Okay. Last so, question? Yeah, um, thanks. <clears throat> um, just to follow up on that a little bit, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, it is on the MMR, um, how quickly an agency responds to the 311. But we don't, there's no, you lose some meaningfulness when you're just saying we, we went out there because Department of Buildings is just one example. They'll close out a complaint when they haven't gained access twice. So their responsiveness does not necessarily correlate to solving the problem. Um, and I think that's what we're looking for. Has the problem been addressed? So I'm also wondering um, um, along those lines, if there's a, uh, a trigger system at all in the 311 database that um, once a complaint gets filed with an, with an agency, if that same location has multiple complaints that go to multiple agency, does it stay siloed like that? Or is, the way, is there a way of bringing those complaints together to say, this is a problem location? Because I know that like FDNY has used DOB data to figure out what locations need to be inspected. Um, do we have a way of bringing this together? 
Um, currently, we don't. The 301 system does not. Uh, some of that work gets done by Mayor's Office of Data Analytics, but it's probably, again, more on a macro basis, on a, on a topic basis. Um, you know, I know last year they did some work on you know, grease traps uh, complaints leading to a theory of something else. So they'll do that type of work. Um, but obviously, there's a, there's a need for them to, to have the issue highlighted before they can dive into it. Um, but as far as then a uh, predictive model, if you will, or to detect a detective model within the 301 system, we don't have that. Is that yeah. going to be in the RFS? Uh, it's not spelled out in the RFS because it's actually, it would not be part of the CRM platform. It would be more of a business intelligence tool. Um, on a personal note, it's something that I am frustrated with at times, so I want to build my own predictive models and, and identify some of those things. So we do want to get to that direction, and, and certainly in the last several years, the technology to be able to do that is certainly you know, leapfrogged in terms of what's available out there to do those types of queries and provide that level of, of, of inspection, if you will. All right, great. Thank you very much. I think we're going to try to follow up on some of the things that were raised later on. Sure. Um, I, I know you guys had a couple of questions we want to follow up individually, and then we'll try to revisit the conversation about the, the working with the agencies and you guys as well to kind of figure out some of those, those uh, kinks that we're experiencing. But thank you very much great. for presenting. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Moving right along, we are going to now hear from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Come on down. Before we get started, I know a number of people joined after we called the roll. So if you joined the meeting and you weren't here for the roll call, can you just announce yourselves? You know, I feel bad. You know, Jerry came after the roll call and then left before the roll call. Uh, Jerry, Jerry has <laughs> <Esposito. laughs> You're so good, Bob. <laughs> and, and perhaps the same for Mr. Henry Butler as well. <laughs> All right. Got everyone? All right. You're on. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Nancy Jeffrey. I work for the health department in the uh, Division of Environmental Health. And I'm going to try to make our presentation pretty short today. Um, I really am here to introduce you guys to our agency's new environment and health data portal. And this is an online resource for um, accessing and using neighborhood level data. And essentially, our site focuses on aspects of the environment that we know can affect health. Um, similar to what hap uh, our our friends at 311 mentioned is we, we actually launched this portal back in 2009 and it was called the environmental public health tracking portal I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with that but over the years it had gotten a little bit stale a little bit difficult to access the data and play with it so in 2014 we relaunched it as a new uh, streamlined hopefully easier to use site and we've named renamed it it's the environment and health data portal So like I said, we really focus on um, aspects of the environment that we know can affect health. The site provides information in the form of data indicators. So rather than having numbers, what I mean by that is we've actually created rates. That way you're able to, um, in a standard way, c compare the data over time and place. So we have data on air quality, the water quality, but we also have data on um, aspects of the urban environment that affect us a lot. So we have data on mice and rats, um, and a lot of other things too. I'm just giving some examples here. Um, and in regards to health data, we have things like asthma hospitalizations, asthma ED visits, um, hospitalizations for heart attacks. We also have information from our poison control center, so you can check out poisonings. And we have data from the fire department when they respond to carbon monoxide poisonings and incidents. 
When it comes to behavior, we have the information that we collect from surveys on smoking and consumption of sugary drinks, how frequently people drink alcohol, um, whether they report binge alcohol drinking. And then we have sustainability indicators. And the sustainability indicators are more like uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. How is New York City's air quality doing compared to the other large cities in the country? So the um, indicators on the site are generated using data from mostly local sources. A lot of these are um, sources that we can get within our own agency. For example, the agency conducts every year an, a population-wide survey of adults. It's called the New York City Community Health Survey. And as that data becomes available, we're able to update it onto our portal. But we also have things from ongoing um, surveillance systems. For example, our New York City Lead Poisoning Prevention Program. They, they create and have data on kids who are getting tested for lead poisoning. Um, how many of those kids have lead levels over 10? That kind of information is what we use to create our indicators. And then we also get um, data from uh, state and federal agency and partners who collect data about New York City. And that's where we get data on pesticide use and sales, um, the New York State Cancer Registry, birth defects. And then uh, because we're interested in looking at whether the frequency of having, um, whether access to alcohol may change or not per people's behavior choices, we also have data from the New York State Liquor Authority on licensing. Those kind of data is also collected. So once you get onto our site, um, it's, awful, it's an awful lot of data. <laughs> we've we've um, calculated it by topic areas. Um, and I think I'm going to save this to really, you'll get a more sense of that when you see the um, demo that Grant is going to give in a couple seconds here. Also, I just wanted to point out, we recently have, um, we've been collecting it for the last three years or so, but we have now a, quite a bit of data collected on housing quality, housing conditions, and, and on aspects of the housing environment that we think can affect health. Okay, this is how we uh, define neighborhoods on the site. Um, we break uh, the different neighborhoods into either 42 separate neighborhoods or 34, and that depends on the um, ability of us to be able to report confidential data in a way that's not going to identify. For example, some cases of birth defects may be very rare. There may be um, unusual types of cancers. We don't want anyone to be identified, so we uh, roll them up. As much as possible, we try to do it in the 42 um, category neighborhoods. And then these are aggregated zip codes to approximate community districts. They are not going to directly overlap with your community districts. And then we also recognize that um, you know there's a difference. Some people are very comfortable going onto a site and playing with it and accessing data and checking it out. Other people really would rather just kind of get a one-page summary or a quick, uh, quick data report. So we've um, created an ability of when you go on their landing page, it's called neighborhood reports. And what we did was we aggregated the indicators on a specific topic. So we have one now on um, housing and health. And you can select a neighborhood that you're interested from the map or go and find it. Grant will demonstrate this for you. But also, I wanted to share, show you a little bit of what the indicators look like so you can see how we've pulled the information together. So these are two pagers that you can print out back to back, one page handout. You can use them in your community district meetings, or people can use them at schools or neighborhood organizations that might be interested in learning more about the issue and hopefully taking an action on it. Um, and we give you just a little bit of information about why it's related to health. Um, you can see how your neighborhood that you selected compares to the borough that you live in or a person is interested in, how it compares to the city number. And then we try to give you a bit of a how, are you, how is this neighborhood doing compared to the other 42 neighborhoods in New York City? So you're either ranking them as better, worse, or in the middle, depending on how that rate falls. And with a little tiny bit of a peak at how is the trend over time. So it's just a very simple way of seeing, is it getting better or worse over time? Okay, and now I'm gonna turn it over to Grant. Wait, one more second, Grant. I just forgot, I need to do one more thing. So I wanted to show you how to get to the site. 
If you go to our agency's homepage and look under data and statistics, you can find us under there. And then also I've put on the table over there these cards. Uh, if you can pick one up on your way out, I think you might, we would love for you to check out the site, play with it, give us your suggestions and feedback, because we are, this is relatively um, new that we're pushing this version out, and we would love to hear feedback if you have suggestions on how we could make it easier to use or something that could be more useful that we haven't captured yet. So thank you, and take a look and check it out, okay? You can also send us your feedback. When you do that, it's just our generic email, and Grant and I will get your comments. <laughs> that comes to us, so thank you. I'm gonna make an attempt to uh, walk, with the, walk with the mic. I'm not sure if this is uh, gonna work or not, but I'll give it a shot. Um, because I'm gonna actually attempt a live demo of our site um, to just give you an idea of what kind of data is available and, and how it feels to be on the site itself. Um, the resolution of this monitor is a little bit wonky, but um, w let me just walk through and you can see what, um, what you have. Um, so this is our site. Um, you're presented with the, these four options. Um, the, the first two options uh, categorize our data into environment data and health behavior and population data. We also allow you to download any of the data that we have available on this site directly right here. Um, we also allow you to download a neighborhood report. Um, I'm going to show you the neighborhood report first, um, just because that was one of the last things that Nancy was talking about. And I'm going to focus on this housing and health report. Now, you can go ahead and put in your zip code, or you can choose from this map to find a neighborhood. I'm going to pick this neighborhood and um, select that from the map. After you click on it, it takes a minute to load, but this is what the report looks like. Um, you can scroll down and see kind of what, how the neighborhood compares in different subject areas. The first one is indoor air quality here. And you can see d down here, we're, we're kind of in the middle of the pack in terms of New York City neighborhoods. Um, but the trend over time uh, is, uh, is actually looks negative. So that's something to keep an eye on. Um, home safety and maintenance, um, compared to other NYC neighborhoods, uh, downtown heights and slope is actually worse overall. And this is mostly um, from data that comes from rental properties, but from our housing, is it the housing vacancy survey? Yeah. But we also have a listing of health outcomes, uh, which describe health outcomes that can be affected by conditions in the home or neighborhood. All right. So. This is just a, you know, it's a couple of pages. You can print this out um, or you can export it into Excel just by clicking up here on this um, little icon or as a Word document, okay? So you can email it to other folks. So that's a good quick way to get some information about um, what's going on in your neighborhood. But what I want to show you also, oh yeah, this is our site is new. Um, I want to show you how to actually access the the bulk of the data on the site. You can come in here and surf through these different topic areas. I'm going to go take you to housing quality. If you're curious about the different topic areas, you can just mouse over the different names here, and you can see on the right-hand side um, where there's a little bit of a description of what's going on here. But let's look at housing quality data. Once you click on it, you have a bunch of different topic areas. Um, we're going to look at homes with three or more maintenance deficiencies, or how about Homes with cracks or holes. Again, this is housing vacancy survey data. So when you download it, again, this is coming up a little bit wonky here on this laptop, but um, you can see uh, a table of all the data. But what's more interesting is um, our graphical views. So here's a neighborhood disparities um, view. You can see um, how homes are crack with cracks or holes appear um, in terms of different socioeconomic groups. So in a low poverty neighborhood, a medium poverty neighborhood, or a high poverty neighborhood, um, you can see that there's a, a drastic difference. Uh, high poverty neighborhoods from year to year um, generally have more homes with cracks or holes. This maybe is no surprise. Um, if you can look at all the data also with our chart over time to see how uh, the numbers are changing. Um, so it looks like there's a, the percentages are actually going up um, over time. 
going to look at a map to see you know, what the different neighborhood values are and how, and you can see it broken up by category to see where the, the problem is greatest. And you can see here how that follows uh, economic lines for the most part in these neighborhoods. I think one of the most interesting features of the site is this um, link data uh, view. And what this does is it actually allows you to track um, two separate indicators. Um, here we have homes with cracks or holes on the bottom. And on the left hand or Y axis, you can see a variety of different choices here. One, one of the most interesting things I think is uh, if you compare cracks or holes with cockroaches, um, you can see this direction of the trend is pretty clear. So when you have cracks or holes, you also tend to have cockroaches. These things vary together, they're correlated. Um, if you want more information about any of this, um, you, can, you can read about the graph on the left, but you can also look down here and look at the information about the measures, how they're calculated, and you can get more information about the subtopic in general by clicking here um, and read about housing quality and how it affects health. So that's kind of a lot. I don't want to go any further, but if anybody has any questions, please. Do you have any questions from Mr. Yeah, Sean? You know, I do. I, I just want to suggest, I mean, this could be such a valuable tool, and, and, and being able to, to draw correlations could be so useful in helping us um, assess needs and draw up our district need statements and, and make budget requests accordingly, which is, you know, our mission. Um, but I'm going to very politely and respectfully suggest that being able to draw down from zip code data to a community district is not that easy. It, it's going, we're going to get very misleading numbers if we try to do that. And so if we could maybe um, get to a community district unit of analysis, that would be very valuable. Okay, we're, we're headed that direction. And we, we, we hear this all the time. Um, and and not, not just us, like everybody on the agency level knows that um, our, the neighborhood grouping that we use, United Hospital Fund Neighborhoods, which was invented 100 years ago and, and is really, or maybe not, but at any rate, um, it's less and less relevant, right? So first of all, we, we do have data at the community district level, okay? Um, all of our air quality data is available at that level. Um, we have housing data, like the stuff I was showing you, at the subborough level, which is basically the same as the Census Puma districts, which are, again, almost identical. There's just a couple of groupings of, of community districts there, but they're almost identical to community districts. So that data is available now on the portal. Um, and there's a big push at the agency to start making all of our data, you know, across the board available, even if we have to combine years of data in order to do it for privacy reasons, um, to make the data available on, at the community district level. And so it's going to happen. Um, it, I can't unfortunately commit to a time right now because it, it doesn't involve just us. I mean, it has to do with it. Right. The, the way some of the survey data are done, they ask people essentially uh, random you know, selection of people in the population about what zip code they live in, and then that's how they are organized. So a lot of our survey data where we get uh, real specific information about behaviors or what may be going inside the home is that they're having to change how they actually collect that survey data. So that will take a little bit more time. Uh, but they're, they're moving that direction. Any other questions? No? All right, great. Thank you very much. All right, number three, a presentation by the Department of Finance. Thank you for um, inviting us to speak to you today. I, too, am going to try and make it quick because 
it's a little um, uncomfortable. Uh, my name is Robin Bermudez. I'm with the New York City Department of Finance, and I'm here to talk to you about the New York City Rent Freeze Program, which is also known as Scree Injury. Just to get an idea, does anyone, has anyone heard of or know what Scree Injury are? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I won't get into the details, though I will get into them a little bit. Um, back in December, the Department of Finance put together a report that details um, where eligible folks live in New York City that are not enrolled in either the Scree or Dree program. The Scree and Dree program are programs that freeze eligible tenants' rents. To be eligible, you need to either be 62 years of age or older or be, on the, um, be receiving federal disability compensation. You need to live in a rent-stabilized, rent-regulated apartment, rent-stabilized, rent-controlled, Mitchell Lama, um, hotel-stabilized. You need to um, pay more than one-third of your income on rent. And just this past summer, um, the state and the city increased the income threshold from $29,000 to $50,000 for the household. So the household must ha make less than $50,000 a third of that must go, um, more than a third of that rather, must go towards rent. So with the increase in the income and the mayor's objective um, focusing on affordable housing, the Department of Finance put together this report. And my colleague, Andre Tirigo, Andre Tirigo, just put, sent out, put in this packet, one of the things is the report that we published, which is also available on our website. And, um, what we found was that there's about 160,000 households in New York City that are eligible for these programs, but 94,000 of them are not enrolled. So our big, one of our big learnings was that we needed to change how we approached outreach to get to these folks. And the first thing we did was rebrand because Scree and Dree really doesn't tell you what the program could do for you, so we rebranded it as the New York City Rent Freeze Program. As soon as you hear that, you know exactly what it's can offer you, what the program provides. Um, in the report, you'll see that, well, actually I should. So in the report, there's borough-wide data as well as information specific to the census tract. Um, Brooklyn has the lowest utilization of all five boroughs. So one of the things that we're doing is over the summer, along with our new approach to outreach, we've come up with a number of different ways, one of which is me being here today, um, to try and get the word out. We are, over this, the next couple of months, we're gonna be having a pilot in the Coney Island Brighton Beach area. We're participating in street fairs, we're coming out um, doing enrollment events, trying to get the word out because, as you can see, in the report, you'll see there's on page 29 our census tract specific information, but of the top 10 neighborhoods in the city that are under enrolled, Coney Island is the number two area. Now, when we look at Coney Island, well, so we changed our outreach, number of different approaches. We're building partnerships with the community um, leaders. We've come out and had a number of meetings in Brighton Beach to talk to um, the Shorefront Y, and the, we have um, some enrollment events scheduled at the library to try and reach the folks that this could affect the most. Um, one of the tools also that we've developed is this mapping system um, that helps us identify throughout New York City, we're talking about Brooklyn right now, so no, this is a map of Northern Brooklyn, all those dots are rent-regulated building apartments in New York. Now, depending on how many apartments are in that building, the size of the circle is larger or smaller. So those big red or red or orange-looking ones have anywhere up to two, over 200 apartments in that building that are rent-regulated so that we can focus our outreach on the area that could most affect eligible tenants. Now, one of the really important things that we learned, too, is though the census tract says Coney Island, 
When we look at, if you look at that red outlined area, which there's actually a map also in your packet, the concentration of regulated apartments is really actually in Brighton Beach between Ocean Parkway and Coney Island Avenue. So th in that area alone, there's um, over 1,600 units that could possibly be eligible. So that's why over the summer, we're now focusing on there. We've started creating um, barcoded applications to see what type of um, outreach is effective. We are, like I said, we've set up um, a number of enrollment events. We are also go just got a permit from Parks Department to set up on the boardwalk um, a couple of nights a week throughout the summer to hand out materials and to speak to folks about the program. Um, we also are working with ethnic media um, and we're putting together now um, some scripts so that we could do some robocalls to tell people about the program um, to over 140,000 households and then also in the select areas as we have more and more um, events scheduled to let them know we're having an event, please come down and you can either speak with us or you can apply and we'll take your applications. So the first thing that we have are our new outreach materials, which are also in your packet. We've designed these POM cards, which basically is just um, eligibility requirements. They're dual-sided. Si dual one side is English and the other is any one of our other five languages. We have um, a supply on the table. The five languages are Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Korean, Haitian Creole, and Bengali. Those are the most requested languages um, for the Department of Finance. If we find an uptick in additional languages, then we would, of course, request to have that translated in that as well. So they're, like I said, dual-sided, English on one side and then the alternate language on the other. We also have a new guide that we put together that we can, um, that details everything you could possibly want to know about SCRI and DRE, um, as well as information on renewing the benefit, um, and if there's changes during the benefit period, whatever the case is. Also in the packet is a poster, a, a flyer actually, sample of posters that we have. These are 20, um, 24 by 36 posters that if you'd like, we could send to your office to put in your location. And on the bottom, it's for, again, it's similar to the palm card in that it has the general um, requirements, that you, what kind of household, build apartment you have to live in. Um, but then also on the bottom, it has a line in each of the six languages saying to request more information, you can contact 311. So we can send that to you as well. Um, and we also have these posters also. They're a little smaller because um, space in the city is not so easy to come by. Um, and a big poster would take up probably a whole wall in a lot of locations. So we have a supply of those here that you can take with you. Uh, we're working on getting these translated as well. So if you wanted um, in any of those other languages, we could supply you with that also. Um, we're here really to ask you guys for your help. Um, we, like I said, in Brighton Beach now, we've created a number of partnerships. We have um, two locations that have volunteered to be um, informational and enrollment centers. So we'll, as we do our outreach, we will be guiding people to those locations if they want help with applications um, or if they just have general questions. We offer coming out to your locations. We get calls from a lot of your community board offices. Um, on help with applications. We can come out and train you guys on the specifics of the application. We've tried to simplify it as best we can, making it one page. Um, so we can come out and do that. If you want a supply of materials, I can give you my card. We're happy to send you, we can send you posters, we can send you uh, as many as you like of the brochures or the flyers in whatever language um, <coughs> relates to your district. Um, we're also looking for, if we are publicizing events or having events in your area, if we can send you a flyer to post or um, just try and get the word out. You know, 94,000 households is a lot, of, a, a lot of folks who can really use this great benefit. When people first come into the program, 
you know, a lot of people are reluctant to apply because they think, oh, it's only going to save me 10 or $15 because their increases, since they're regulated from one lease to the next, aren't all that great, though there's still increases. The longer that they're in the program, the greater the benefit. If someone enters the program now at 62, in 20 years, they're still going to be paying the frozen rent that they're paying now. The way that the program works is as the landlord increases legal rents, once we freeze your rent, the difference between the frozen rent and the legal rent is credited to the landlord's property taxes. So as they stay in the program and they continue to renew, then that their frozen rent stays the same, but the credit that we give the landlord is what increases. So over time, we've seen folks that pay a frozen rent of $500, but their legal rent is $2,300. So it's really a great benefit. The, again, the longer you stay in, the greater the benefit. Um, so like I said, I have cards. If you would like, there's materials there. Um, there's palm cards in the various languages, as well as the posters. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Hopefully that was quick enough. Great, thank you very much. Can we have a question, Marnie? Yes. Yes, I have a quick question yes. for you. Um, one of the challenges that we see on behalf of our residents um, is this preferential rent. Um, let's say they're paying $1,100, they qualify for the SCREE program. Right. Um, they're approved, but it's approved, awarded at $2,500. Right. So, so they're not taking part in this program, they're not benefiting from it. Well. And Preferential rent is a rent that's agreed upon between the tenant and the landlord that is less than their legal rent. Mm -hmm. um, in most cases, the landlord only guarantees that prefer rent, preferential rent for the life of that lease. So they're not guaranteed to get it the next lease. Though in most cases they do. They do. Uh, right. When, if someone has preferential rent for the life of their tenancy, so their rider says that they are getting preferential for the life of their tenancy, then we will freeze their rent at that preferential rent amount. No, I understand It's that. not very often, but exactly. it does. Exactly, it's not the norm. Now, if they apply for the program and they have preferential rent, mm -hmm. we freeze the rent at the legal rent, which could be much higher. Right. But if their preferential rent, because the preferential rent also increases. Yes. So their pre what they would pay would never increase more than that legal rent that we've frozen it at. And as they, get, as they get increases on that legal rent, because the landlord still increases that rent, the landlord's gonna be getting that credit on top of the preferential rent. Does that make sense? So if their, if their preferential rent is 500 mm -hmm. and their legal rent is 1,000 on the renewal, le on renewal their legal rent now goes up to 1050. The landlord's gonna get now $50 credit from us plus what he's getting from the tenant on their preferential. So the landlord gets more money because we now are crediting them the difference between the frozen and whatever the legal rent is increasing to plus they're getting the preferential rent amount and the, land, and the tenant's rent can never increase more than the legal rent at the time they come into the system. But, but the, they're receiving an award letter that it's frozen at 2,500. So they would right. have to meet from 1,100 to 25? No, it's frozen there, but their preferential rent is an agreement between them and the landlord. So they pay whatever the landlord exactly. requires them to pay. But, yes, but, but I understand the confusion. a $1,400 rent, a median rent of $1,400. Right. They're the ones that are losing, in my opinion because they can afford, they're making less than 53,000, much less than 53,000. 50,000. Yes, and right. they're not benefiting from that freeze. Right. It's unfortunate, that's all. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions from service cabinet members? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, last but certainly not least, we have a quick update from the Brooklyn Public Library on a current advocacy campaign.
I'll get started while Michelle is doing that. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for your patience and time, and thanks for um, having us here today. Um, I, first of all, I want to start off by thanking uh, the community boards for uh, welcoming our staff every month. Uh, this year and, and last, we've been doing something that's completely new, which is uh, we have a librarian uh, rep at every single community board meeting, and it's been really helpful for us, and we appreciate your feedback and your comments and definitely uh, welcome them every month, so I wanna thank you for that. Um, I also uh, wanna uh, let you know about our bookmobile. Um, we have a, a two bookmobiles available. We have a, a regular bookmobile for adults, and then we have a kids mobile, and that is available um, for any event that you may need it. So if you are interested in booking or having the bookmobile attend one of your events, uh, please uh, definitely email us and let us know. And if you don't have our information, I can give it to you um, at the end of the meeting. And then finally, I'm here also want to introduce our new uh, VP of Government Affairs, uh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle has joined us uh, December, and um, we've been working hard on the advocacy campaign, and she'll tell you more about that. Hi, morning, still morning. I think. Um, uh, we'll be quick also, thanks so much. Again, thanks for all of your partnership and support um, and for having us this morning. Uh, as Nyla said, I just joined the Brooklyn Public Library in December. I came from uh, the American Cancer Report, so I was very interested in the health department's um, presentation as well. Uh, so we're, I'm just going to tell you a little bit on what the library has been up to and the status of our budget advocacy this year. Um, so first of all, uh, some of the great things that are happening inside our libraries uh, last year we had a record 783,000 people attend our programs, which is an increase of 20% over the previous year. And of course, people who attend those programs, many of them will go on to start businesses or graduate from college or uh, contribute in some way to the artistic and cultural life of Brooklyn. And uh, that's in part thanks to the help they receive from staff and volunteers at the library. Our patrons logged more than 2 million sessions on our 1,100 free public computers. And the usage of the library's free wireless increased by almost 40%. We engaged a record number of kids in our summer reading program. Uh, this is a picture of last year's kickoff, but I want you to mark your calendars because June 4th at 10 a.m. is this year's big kickoff at Central Library, and it's going to be superhero themed. That'll be a fun way to engage folks. We taught the art of comic book creation to elementary school students at New York City Housing Authority Community Centers. And our outreach department uh, has a telestory program that facilitated virtual story times, sing-alongs, and other bonding activities for incarcerated parents and their children. Um, often people are uh, sent far away. It's hard for their families to uh, go and visit often, and so we facilitate a way for people to electronically speak to their loved ones. It's, it's a pretty terrific program. So library usage is at an all-time high, and demand for our services has never been greater, actually. Uh, but unfortunately, the city's support for its libraries hasn't kept pace. Uh, the executive budget proposal, which just came out for, for FY16, provides the library with 20% less discretionary funding than we received in 2008, uh, which is a cut from last year's adopted budget. While there was inclusion for the first time in t uh, ever in the 10-year capital plan, it doesn't go far enough to address the staggering capital needs we have throughout our system, which I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with. Last year, the mayor and the council baselined our funding, and they allocated an additional $10 million to the th New York's three library systems. Um, B Book and Public Library share of that was about $2.8 million. With that funding, we uh, and implementing several operating efficiencies, we were able to do our most extensive hiring and, and training since 2008. We brought aboard 28 new staff members, most of whom, whom are youth librarians. We trained uh, staff to make sure that all 60 of our branches would have technology resource specialists available to help patrons access our free technology and improve their digital literacy. And we expanded hours of service at branches throughout the borough. So the number of libraries offering six-day service increased from 28, 23 branches to 39 branches. The number of libraries offering Saturday service increased from 40 to 47 branches. And we added many evening hours at our locations. 
But the, again, as I mentioned, the proposed budget eliminates the funds that allowed us to do that last year to expand our hours and hire more librarians. And if that funding is not restored, um, the library is going to be forced to roll back our expanded service. Uh, we need to do no more. All New Yorkers should be able to take their children to the library after work or on weekends. Um, and so New York City's three library systems, NYPL, Queens Library, Brooklyn Library, together launched the Invest in Libraries campaign. It's a partnership uh, also with our, our union, DC 37, and other supporters. And we officially kicked it off on March 20th. Um, there's a picture here of our rally. Uh, we held our first successful citywide lobby day at, um, at City Hall on the 16th. We've launched a website. The address is on the buttons that you've been given at uh, investinlibraries.org. And there's a way for people to send an, an email to the mayor and to their uh, direct members, council members, urging them to support libraries. Um, we, to date, we've sent 6,000 letters, um, and we're planning to do even more. The, so the three library systems through the Invest in Libraries campaign are asking for two things. One, to restore our funding levels to 2008 levels, which would be increasing by 65 million. That would be, again, a restoration to 2008 levels. And we've asked to be included in the 10-year capital plan. Now, I mentioned we were included in the 10-year capital plan for the first time in the executive budget, which was terrific news. Um, the not so terrific part of it is that it was far less than we needed. Uh, so uh, all three systems got $300 million over 10 years. So that amounts to $100 million per system over 10 years, $10 million a year. Um, which is about what we get from the mayor uh, currently. So it's nice that it's memorialized in a capital plan, um, but our ask uh, was for $1.4 billion, $1 billion over 10 years. Um, if you're familiar, you know that the Brooklyn Library has $300 million in unfunded capital needs. So um, that the amount that we received is not enough to get uh, full building overhauls and, and big renovations. So when our libraries are not open later on the weekends, fewer working families are able to take advantage of our resources and our programming. Uh, and so uh, that's another reason we really need our expense funding, our operating funds restored. Uh, and I just want to point out a recent report that the Center for an Urban Future did showing that you know, Brooklyn libraries are average, on average are open about 45 hours a week. Um, and in total, New York City's public libraries, when you compare them to the nation's 10 largest cities, are open far less. You can see we're ranked seven out of the top 10 uh, urban libraries. Only San Jose and Houston offer fewer service hours than we do. And furthermore, New York City public libraries are open fewer hours than every large county in New York State, uh, except for one Broome County, which has no Saturday service, uh, no seven-day service. This really has to change, and we, we know you agree with us. Uh, with 65 million in restorations, we can restore six-day services to all branches in Brooklyn. We'd be able to extend hours at our current six-day service branches, and we would be able to bring 10 other branches up to seven-day service. Um, we are also be able to increase our collections. Our, our book buying budget has been reduced by 20% since 2008 due to budget cuts, so we'd be able to have more robust materials collection for people, and we'd have safer and cleaner branches because we'd finally be able to hire safety and custodial staff that have been stretched so thin over these last years. So uh, this is just a, a, a terrific image of the Brownsville Library on opening day in 1908. Kids lined up around the block. Uh, it is a Carnegie branch, and just to solidify the Carnegie um, agreement, which established libraries in the the vision of having a city where all people could have equal access to public library branches. Um, we've created this postcard, which Nyla has post passed around. Um, we have six weeks left to work with the city to improve the circumstances for libraries, and we'd love your help in, in joining us. Um, the uh, buttons are available, and we have plenty of them if you'd like us to bring them to your meetings and, and um, pass them out to the public. Um, we'd love your help in letting the community know that we are fighting to be able to expand service uh, and they can join our campaign. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, any questions from members of the service cabinet? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do, uh, do any district managers have any announcements to share? I forgot to mention that in the beginning. Any agencies have any announcements to share? Postal service? Yes. Friday.
Great, thank you. Any other announcements from uh, agency partners? Any old business? Any new business? Okay, our next meeting will be Tuesday, June 9th. That is for district managers only. Uh, Tuesday, June 9th. So we will see the full service cabinet again after the summer on September 9th. Um, but June 9th is just for district managers. We have a motion to adjourn. All right, everyone. Th thank you very much for coming.